Great introduction. Thank you. Um, is it now recording? We are on live. Sorry about that. Okay. So one of the questions is why is this uh, middle passage so important? Uh, what was what was the purpose and the outcome? And very generally, it was created um, to establish and maintain wealth by providing labor to extract resources and develop the Americas uh, with a Euro-centered economy and culture. The system was designed to also commodify and dehumanize people. It expanded and organized the maritime economy. It established a model for a global economy, which now we take for granted. It also removed 24 million Africans from their communities. When we talk about those who were transported uh, in the Middle Passage, we talk about 12 million. What we don't realize is that another 12 million people were taken from their communities and forced to the coasts of both East and West Africa. So half of the people who were to be part of uh, the human trade died before they ever got on, you know, before uh, they reached the, the coast. And it repositioned uh, commercial and political centers in Africa. Uh, traditionally, most of the uh, kingdoms were in, located off of the coast. Uh, once commerce was centered uh, with the shipping, a lot of these uh, capitals, such as Accra, Senegal, all of these locations moved to the Atlantic so that they could be part of the trade. I mean, there were people in power politically uh, who sought and, and obtained uh, economic advantage from being in the trade. Those were the Africans. Uh, it enabled the 19th century African colonialism uh, by Europe because once you have depleted, you know, so many people over a course of 300 years from these federations and communities, um, it was very easy for then for European uh, countries to already build on the network that had been established uh, by the transatlantic trade. It also, and probably uh, I would say most directly we are aware that it served as the foundation for the industrial revolution in Europe and US because it was the labor of these imported people um, who provided the raw materials, whether it was uh, the agriculture of cotton, or sugar or tobacco. Um, but I, I really want to sort of uh, emphasize that there were skills that were required uh, in all of these uh, agricultural industries. And for the most part, the Africans who were brought in were more familiar with that process than the Europeans coming from another climate. Uh, next slide, please. So the Middle Passage history, uh, it starts in 1510 with the Portuguese and Spanish and we're talking specifically uh, to the Americas, it would have started uh, 1510, uh, Hispaniola. And it goes into the 1890s because both Brazil and Cuba were the last nations uh, to abolish slavery. And so that manpower was continuously uh, being brought in for the, basically for the sugar uh, production. So 12 million Africans transported, and I think this is really critical because it says a lot, in the forced, the largest forced migration in human history. And these people went to Europe and the Americas. It included children, women, and men. And I always put the children first because I think that when we talk about the trade, we very often are thinking about adults, um, but the emphasis really, and the later on in time, the emphasis becomes 
children and women uh, because of the anticipation of resistance and the fact that uh, um, women produce people so that this can be a natural conduit for either maintaining or extending your labor force. Uh, in the United States, what becomes the United States, uh, the first uh, shipment of Africans um, was 1526. The Africans who came before, and of course they came with the Spanish, uh, were basically just part of the crew or the exploration of territory. But in 1526, the Spanish left uh, six with sh six ships from Hispaniola and uh, sailed up the Atlantic coast. They went as far as North Carolina, hit a lot of storms, and then um, came back down to Sapelo Bay, which is the region of uh, South Carolina and Georgia. There were approximately 100 Africans uh, in that group. All of them escaped uh, after about eight or nine months of uh, being kept in the area, in the settlement to build and to grow crops. Uh, they burned the settlement down and escaped into the uh, further into the mainland. And we assume that they existed from that point on with uh, the First Nation people of that area. So in terms of what do you do with this manpower that you are forcing to work, um, eventually there have to be laws. And contrary to, I think, what also is a misinterpretation of history, the first slave acts were uh, instituted in Massachusetts, and that's 1641, not in Virginia, not in South Carolina. Um, so that this is, and, and this is critical, I think, this is a national history. Um, it was in Massachusetts geared to Native American people, uh, but it also included the Africans who had arrived by that time. And this legal slavery uh, was part of U.S. society and culture until 1865. And I put a caveat here for those of you who are not aware, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery except under the penal or criminal justice system so that there is only one state in the United States of America that has completely abolished slavery. And that is Colorado. Every other state follows the US uh, 13th Amendment. So there's, there's that, I would put a pin in that because again, we're talking about the residue of Middle Passage history and slavery. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to put a political statement in here because I think it's crucial that we as a country always talk about a minimum wage. I think that part of that construct and that attitude is based upon a, a labor of enslavement so that we're not talking living wage. We literally are talking minimum. And I think that comes as, as part of having been a, a country that had slavery as part of its economic system for so long. In 1808, because by that time, actually, people of color were the major population group on the North American mainland. So you had native people and you had Africans. The uh, founding fathers in writing the constitution put in a clause that said, as of 1808, we will not permit the immigration of any more Africans into this country. Well, 
that didn't go off too well. And then by 1820, another effort is made. It's uh, the US Act to Protect Commerce and Punish the Crime of Piracy. That forbade uh, any US uh, company or investor in participating in the slave trade and in the transporting of Africans. Needless to say, uh, both of those US uh, laws were in fact um, ignored uh, by investors and those in the maritime industry. Next. And I have to describe what this middle passage was. It was the removal of these people from their communities for political reasons, for economic growth, uh, for territorial expansion. And they were taken to uh, pens and barracoons and castles and dungeons. Uh, there they may remain anywhere from a week to several months. Uh, the Gore and Elmira, Gore in Senegal and Elmira Castle and some of the other castles that were built uh, by Europeans uh, on the coast of Africa as well as in Madagascar and Zanzibar, uh, all were holding areas where then the ship's uh, captains would come in and make their selection of people. Uh, once they were purchased by the, uh, Af from the African traders, they were transported by canoes to the ships. And these captives endured, and I will just read this because I think it's better for me to just read, for weeks and sometimes months. In filth, they suffered dehydration, dysentery, hunger, depression, disease, insanity, heartbreak, rape, and many forms of violence and terror because it was with violence and terror that they could in fact uh, enable the shipment. These people were stripped naked and forced into the hold of the vessel, normally 100 to 500 people, tight or loose packing, Often women and children remained above deck. But, you know, I, I tell people, if you go into your living room and imagine, you know, that you're gonna keep 300 people there for weeks or months, and then that room is gonna go across the ocean. Then you have a better sense of what these people endured. Uh, by mid 19th century, the greater number of children were transported. And in terms of how do you manage the system, it was the point at which enslavement and total loss of liberty for these people occurred. Crews, captains anticipated that there would be heightened resistance, rebellion, and attempted escapes, most of them just jump overboard uh, because captives were then realizing that their removal was permanent. Captives also thought that the Europeans initially were taking these people because they thought Europeans were cannibals. Uh, so they thought they were being shipped uh, to be a food supply. Um, so for many, for most, Africa would vanish except as a place of memory and diffused knowledge. Many people committed suicide. There were also, as I look through the records uh, and look at the voyage data, uh, there are so many uh, instances of insurrection. Uh, so that outcome of voyage, unknown, enslaved people uh, took over the ship. Sometimes, you know, they didn't know where they were, but very often if they could hit the current, they could go back to Africa, not necessarily to their homes. But this is basically the ocean voyage. There are some countries that I think conducted um, the voyages less harshly, 
certainly the Spanish and the Portuguese uh, did very intense inventory. And because their trade also was tied up with religion, a great number of the people who were captive while they were waiting to be uh, purchased by these captains would be baptized. They would be branded. Their names would be changed uh, to European uh, Christian names. And you have a process. Each country is very different in how it handled uh, this, this preparation for Middle Passage. Uh, next slide, please. So what does this mean for us? Well, because there was a steady demand for a large labor force uh, with skills, and in particular, uh, the Spanish had developed a whole system of sugar plantations on the Canary Islands right off of the coast of Africa. Well, they took that, the Portuguese in particular, took that to Brazil. Uh, so in that country and most of the South America and the Caribbean, the emphasis was on sugar production. A lot of these people already knew how to do that. I mean, we're not just talking raw labor. When you talk about South Carolina, the people that are transported there are familiar with rice. Uh, there also was a demand, and this is coming out of uh, West Africa around Ghana, uh, there's a demand for uh, metalsmiths. So you have people coming with skills that are being forced to work and survive uh, uncompensated and then, uh, I guess, limited and restricted by violence and terror. Um, to develop and maintain these settlements, uh, became a national commercial enterprise for Spain, England, uh, the Dutch, the French, the Danish are the five primary uh, nations. And they set up uh, their colonies or their settlements as commercial centers. Uh, it also then, as I said previously, established a network of resources, investment, and profit. And I remember uh, making a similar presentation in Baltimore years ago, uh, where a young black woman just stood up and she says, you're making this sound like it's just business, nothing personal. I said, well, that's what these people made it. Uh, you dehumanize people and then it, it's not personal. It's only about business. Uh, the original people who were uh, slated to do the labor in most of the colonies were uh, the indigenous people. For the most part, it didn't work out because they could escape. They knew the territories better. And also um, disease. So when the Europeans decided that that wasn't working out, they tried an indentured servant system. Well, that didn't work out either because people, again, could escape. They could go to another settlement. Nothing about them stood up or stood out. You have an entire colony, Georgia, and also, uh, I would say, Louisiana. Both of those colonies were established to clean the streets of what uh, the powers believed were the undesirables. So England empties uh, a lot of its prisons and a lot of its almhouses, puts these people on ships and says, you know, you can be free, you can go to this colony, your debt is forgiven. Interestingly enough, in Georgia originally, it was uh, with Oglethorpe, a statement that there could be no Africans imported because he knew that once there was an alternative labor source, the Europeans would refuse to do the hard work. Uh, in Louisiana, there was um, an effort by the French to clean out the streets of uh, Paris 
uh, of prostitutes. So young women were put on ships. They were given a hope chest. The hope chest was the size that would accommodate uh, their burial, their coffin, if in fact either they didn't make the passage or when they got to the new colony of Louisiana, uh, if they succumbed to disease. So we're talking about a variety of approaches. Um, there are 52 documented Middle Passage arrival locations. Again, this is not a regional or Southern uh, history. These locations range from New Hampshire to Texas. And they include the Spanish, the French, the English, and the Dutch. The Dutch in New York, in particular. Uh, but along with this, if you're going to maintain these people, you're going to restrict them, you're going to enslave them. Uh, what also parallels the uh, development of, of slavery are beha behaviors, beliefs, and theories, and laws. That's combined with a sense of what I guess, I don't know what you were taught in history, but it was called manifest destiny when I heard it first. And it meant that Europeans uh, had a right to the land. But by uh, 1830, there was also the realization that the population had to look different. And that is the period in which from 1850 till I would say right before the Civil War, there was a concentrated effort to bring in Europeans uh, into this nation so that what became a European uh, dominated population really starts from the 1830s. Uh, and aligned with that is the removal of native people, particularly uh, east of the Mississippi. So you have the Indian Removal Act, of which I guess most of us are familiar with the Trail of Tears, where the Oklahoma Territory is identified as the uh, place where the five nations would go. And I always talk about a Trail of Tears. I did not realize until I started doing this history that we're actually talking about five distinct trails North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama. So as the frontier, the manifest destiny is being realized, the people who live in these areas are forced uh, to leave. The state of Florida uh, became a haven for these tribes. Uh, and that's how the Seminole people were actually created. They are an amalgam of native people and, and Africans. And they went into what was considered at the time uh, inhabitable uh, lands, the Everglades. Um, next slide, please. So specifically, if we get to geography and history, and I do wanna talk about New York. Uh, out of New York, between 1655 and 1775, we have identified 78 transatlantic voyages. And these voyages delivered captive Africans directly to New York City. I'm not counting whether they transported people to other locations uh, on the North American mainland. So there are 78 transatlantic voyages. You can estimate that they're probably anywhere from 150 to 200 people per voyage. And you can estimate the number of people who were brought in directly from Africa to New York. In addition, between 1683 and 1863, and this is actually during the Civil War, 166 ships went out of New York and transported Caf captive Africans to various US locations in the Americas, that's South America and Central America and the Caribbean. Next slide, please. And since we're talking the harbor, and I don't know, uh, I don't know distinctly the history of New York and New Jersey, but I know that in terms of the harbor, uh, Perth Amboy 
was a major drop off place uh, because they, the co that colony charged no tariff. So that a lot of the ships would opt to come into Perth Amboy and then transport people to either Delaware, Pennsylvania, or New York. Uh, there are seven documented voyages uh, between eight, of 1686 and 1763 that disembarked approximately 745 captive Africans from West, Central, and East Africa. And we do know that at least out of New Jersey, 100 people are recorded as transported to New York. Next slide, please. So where do we fit in in this project? Well, uh, 35 years ago, as a birthday gift, someone said to me that Toni Morrison was concerned that there was no acknowledgement of the history of the Middle Passage the remembrance of the two million who died in the ocean voyage. And the person said, I have no idea what to do with this information. So happy birthday, Anne. So 25 years later, or 20 years later, after much thought, we decided that a project that would all include or, or promote remembrance ceremonies. And I think that uh, long before we started this project, there were remembrance ceremonies, say on the East River in New York, uh, in South Carolina, at Sullivan's Island. And certainly families had been doing some ancestral remembrance uh, activity throughout the history uh, since they came to this country. We decided that we would identify the arrival locations and put up markers. It seemed like a simple idea at the time. Well, 10 years later, we're only halfway through. We use primarily the Voyages Transatlantic Slave Trade database and then research by local historians. And so far we have supported 32 of the 52 communities with remembrance ceremonies and there have been 28 markers related to Middle Passage ship arrival. Presently, 20 are in some stage of planning for markers within the next two years. And within the next two years is really optimistic. I'm using 2026 as the goal for the completion of this project. And I want that to coincide as the nation observes its 250th year of independence as a nation that stands alone, to acknowledge that this nation is created by many people and the people who are very frequently omitted or cherry picked are those of African descent. Uh, 42 of these documented arrival locations have been designated as international sites of itinerary and memory by UNESCO. It requires resistance, liberty, and heritage. Next slide, please. And I wanted, I didn't want to use markers that come from the South. I think it's important, again, that people understand that this is a national history. So these markers that you're looking at, the one on the left of the screen is from Middletown, Connecticut. And they put their marker in uh, in Middletown at the waterfront in 2019. The marker on the right was six years in the making in terms of everybody finally agreeing what it ought to look like and what it ought to say, because all of those decisions we leave to the local communities. We really want every locale to own its marker in terms of design. The only thing we, we request is that the text be historically accurate. We strongly encourage that each marker be put by the water because otherwise the concept of even the middle passage I think becomes abstract. So this is the latest one, it's in Boston. Uh, it was put up in October of 2020. It has LED lights, it's the fanciest one 
we have ever had, except for the, the marker that uh, we say is a marker at the uh, New York burial ground, but that, uh, we'll get to that later. Uh, but, but this one in Boston is sort of like uh, our Rolls Royce of markers. <laughs> um, and the Park Service and the city of Boston paid for that. Uh, that one is like over $10,000. Most of the markers are 2,500 to 5,000. Uh, we have one side that we encourage to have the local history and on the other side, if they've been designated as a site of memory, um, the text and, and uh, marker image or logo that UNESCO requires. So this is Connecticut and, and Boston. Next slide, please. One of the things that, that certainly this ceremony promotes is cultural heritage. So you have on the left, this was our very first ceremony in 2012 in Baltimore at Fells Point, which is where the ships would have come in uh, during the 18th century uh, into Baltimore or where the ships would have gone out as part of the uh, domestic trade. Um, it is at this location and the people here on the left are pouring libation as part of the ceremony. It's a traditional African practice uh, honoring ancestors. We also in each uh, location encourage that First Nation people uh, be approached and we ask permission to install the marker and to hold the remembrance ceremony to a location. Every indigenous or First Nation people have responded for the, this is the first time anyone has asked us permission to do anything on this land. Uh, I think that that is remarkable. Uh, we also say to, to First Nation people, this is not a reenactment. You do not have to come uh, dressed in any particular way. Uh, these are, this is a Choctaw uh, Nation dancer who is in, uh, was in Mobile, Alabama for the unveiling of the marker that's in the background. Uh, he's dancing and they, I would say took up probably uh, a good quarter of the uh, installation program. Uh, singing, dancing, and, and celebrating a connection. Next slide, please. So here we go. Why I hope <laughs> that we are here today. What about New York Harbor? Well, you've got some things already covered. New York is and has received since 2018 the designation as a site of memory by UNESCO. Thanks to Superintendent McKinney. She submitted the request along with uh, 30 initial submissions and that uh, request was granted. So I look at the African Burial Ground National Monument as a temporary Middle Passage uh, acknowledgement and uh, Superintendent McKinney has said that part of the tour of the African burial ground, there is mention of the Middle Passage. So I would say it serves as a, as a temporary marker specifically related to the Middle Passage. However, I would like, uh, and I, when I say I, we're talking you know, our project, would like to see a permanent marker on the waterfront in a location with foot traffic and public access. In two locations specifically, um, in Galveston, Texas, and the Independence uh, Museum in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the Middle Passage marker is right at the Seaport Museum. Uh, so it, it, it makes the connection. Uh, what is being planned in Charleston is this huge museum, the International Museum of African-American History, I think it's called, 
they will put their marker right at the harbor. Uh, it will be part of the museum landscape. And in doing that, they will identify or include three other um, islands that were what was called lazarettos or quarantines locations uh, for shipments bringing people from Africa. Uh, sort of like the, I guess, the Ellis Island of these locations. Tybee Island uh, in Georgia served the same purpose. So uh, Galveston, Texas did a map that showed um, the Mississippi and the Gulf uh, to demonstrate, uh, not the Mississippi, but the Gulf as, as a location uh, because it was smuggling. So we could only say that folks came into Galveston, but because it was part of a smuggling uh, operation continuously, we don't have uh, exact details. So for New York, I would hope that a committee can be formed that will address text and design and identify a funding source and research whatever is the process for installing public markers. I mean, I think that it's different if you use public space as opposed to private space. Uh, and then select a location and again, at the waterfront. I think that's as much as I want to say. I don't want to take up a lot of time. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm open for questions. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. All right, let's open it up to questions. Well, this is Chris and again, a, an amazing presentation that just prompt, prompts so much thought and reflection. I guess the, the one question I'd ask you with your conclusion is if you had a location on the harbor in a public location, is there one historical um, point of entry that ranks above the others that you would most like to see as the location of a harbor marker? Well, one thing I think definitely at the waterfront uh, if there is a museum or a public facility where people go uh, to learn about maritime history or the harbor, uh, that would be one option, uh, certainly. Uh, and I think it may be easier if it is on an already established uh, property. Sure. Yeah. So that, that would be uh, my, my only... My only request uh, that that be taken into consideration. Sure, no, of course. Um, obviously, South Street Seaport then would be <laughs> a combination. Yeah, it's a good I, segue. I have a Chris. suggestion. <laughs> go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, no, you go ahead, Maggie. Oh, yeah. I had a suggestion um, exactly along those same lines that um, the city now is doing major infrastructure projects all along the waterfront downtown with resilience, but I was in a meeting where they are looking for community benefits to be associated with that and bringing up how these very same waterfronts were where the enslaved people landed um, might get the city interested to be including a marker there. Yeah, and, and when we talk about the history, uh, because, I mean, we're talking two or 300 years, you know, waterfronts vary. So uh, I guess I was glad that Long Wharf could put theirs in, uh, the Boston could put theirs in at Long Wharf, but um, Annapolis is doing its sort of waterfront reconstruction after they figured out that, oh, you know, they're going to flood <laughs> so that they they have uh, they're going to put their marker in as as two plaques into a, a walled structure as part of that design. So I, I think that there there are many options. I always suggest that uh, if, in fact, you can identify the commercial dock area uh, of the 17th 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, those are the first options um, for location. Because that's where the enslaved people, I mean, they were commodities, so they, they would not have arrived possibly uh, in the same area as, pa as, other, as other, quote, passengers. 
Exactly. Jonathan? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Chin, I apologize for not being on camera, but I am a haggard mess. Somehow in the context of the <laughs> pandemic, I still managed to catch a really bad head cold. So, um, oh, But sure. I am so very pleased to be here today. And that was, that was a really <clears throat> quite uh, informative and moving presentation. I, I thought I knew more than I do, apparently. Um, so I, I thank you for uh, broadening my perspective here. Um, I represent the South Street Seaport Museum, which is um, sort of, it's, uh, you, you mentioned these other places in which maritime museums are uh, a location for this. And, and I would say, um, you know, certainly we have a pier that sticks out into the East River that um, is, you know, a, a stone's throw at best from where um, slave ships were outfitted during the formal portion of the Middle Passage. And there's data to support that, in fact, um, illicit slavers were being outfitted in the East River even after abolition. Um, <clears throat> so I think location certainly is, you know, uh, on the East River is, is an option. Um, I think many of the things that you raised are, are, are simple beyond belief. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I won't make any commitment today uh, because I, well, I tend to do that and then and get myself into trouble. But you know, this this makes all the sense in the world, right? In terms of location, Thank we you. have it, and yeah. we can do it. Um, uh, the 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 money, the scale of dollars that you're talking about is is frankly trivial. Um, I, I think the 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 challenge and the opportunity here, though, is to. I mean, it's, it's really easy to say yes to this. Super, super, super easy. That's the easy part. But but you illuminated through your description of community engagement around this that yes is the easy part, that the opportunity lies in whether it is building a coalition of people locally who are invested in this right along, whether it is inviting First Nations peoples to be a part of this, that to do it properly is a, a robust effort. Um, and I, uh, I don't take that lightly, but I will say in the enthusiasm of the moment and without, uh, without in, in no backsees that I volunteer myself and the Seaport Museum's um, you know, attention on this as, as whether we end up hosting it or merely being part of shepherding it into um, existence. It, it, it makes all the sense in the world. I'm frankly uh, embarrassed that it hasn't happened yet. Um, so we'd like to be part of that solution. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Really, thank you. It's wonderful. Thank you. Ray? Hi. Thank you so much, Ms. Chin. This was, this was amazing. I, I, I'm a, a born and raised in Baltimore. I'd love to pick your brain about Baltimore's uh, contribution to this. I'm always fascinated to learn about that. But more importantly, I was curious, it, it occurs to me that has there ever been a monument or any tribute uh, floating in the water or some sort of in water tribute. I mean, the water is, is actually what connects all of these pieces of land. And it feels like that's calling out for some sort of conversation piece as well. So many mariners navigate both commercial, recreational, navigate past a lot of these physical monuments and don't ever, or aren't able ever to see that. But yet if there were something powerful in the water to, bring everyone's attention to what transpired and how this water connects all these lands. It, it feels like there's a powerful statement there somewhere. Well, let, <laughs> let, let me say that that's, that's biting off that's awesome. a lot. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not saying no, uh, <laughs> but what, I, what I'm saying is that before we can make this uh, anything beyond the immediate locations, which I, I will tell you has been a difficult and challenging process over these last 10 years. Um, also, if in fact you put a monument in a place, everyone who is not at that place doesn't get it, <laughs> doesn't have access to it. And one of the things that we really wanted to stress is that at each of these locations, this is the place of arrival. It's just like for most of us in our families. I mean, my family started out in Virginia. Uh, they went to Massachusetts. They went to different, I mean, wherever the arrival 
was, I think needs to be marked first. Um, I know that there is something that was put in the East River several years ago, maybe a, more than a decade. Well, there's, yeah. the famous, there's, the, there's the famous statue over by Pier A, um, which is just right down at the lower tip, which with the figure in the water um, of the, uh, the fire boathouse rescue first responders. And there's a, there's a body in the water that you can see. Um, but I, I can also tell Ray, and I, I love the suggestion, but I can tell you knowing a little bit about that, putting anything in the water, if Anne has been patient to get to 10 years, putting in the water is going to take 20. It's just <laughs> so much regulation. And Aggie, I love the idea of stitching it into the lower Manhattan, you know, re reconstruction of what the waterfront edge will look like and bring that, that community in as well. And Jonathan, what a great offer for South Street Seaport to either be the host or be a part of the team. So thank you. Are there other questions for Ann? It's starting to, to be great. the Rick, Courtney, go ahead. Oh, I think Rick, Rick, did you have your hand up? I just, I just want to mention the, that that area, Chris, is, is a is would be a great spot. There's an awful lot of people that get through there. That memorial that you're talking about happens to be to Merchant Mariners. Uh, it comes from the Second World War. That's right. my bad. Exactly, but, Rick. But I think that's an area that uh, that really could be uh, taken advantage of because so many people walk through that area going out to the Statue of Liberty. And, and and that that story about the Statue of Liberty, I'm sure, is not known by 99% of the people in this country. If you had some way of educating people as they got on those boats, I think you'd do yourself a great service. Yeah, I think that, you know, whatever a locale decides ought to be in their text, uh, you know, there, there are, there's history, there's broad and rich history in every location. I mean, I, I remember the first marker we put in was in Yorktown, Virginia. And uh, a man who was in his 80s told me, I've lived here all my life, I never even knew yeah. that this occurred. We went to Jamestown, we had to battle uh, to say that Jamestown is not, and we all, I don't know about your history in your classes, but we were all told first Africans arrived in Virginia in 1619 in Jamestown. Well, no, they arrived at Point Comfort. And at one point we were under almost a court suit because we were insisting that Point Comfort is the place of arrival. They can be transported, you know, to Jamestown, but the first folks coming into the Virginia colony. And again, we're only, then you're only talking about British colonial history. I'm saying let's push this back to 1526 with the Spanish. I mean, this is an ongoing history that we are discovering. So whatever text each locale wants to put into the relationship of place to history related to Middle Passage, or emancipation or whatever, you know, I would say do it. Chuck? Yeah, we're not we're not heavy handed at all. <laughs> Just require yeah. historical correctness. And New York is a documented arrival site. <laughs> Chuck, did you have your hand up? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, first of all, Anne, thank you so much uh, for the talk and for I, I'm going to say quite frankly, for me, the reminders, uh, I, you know, I grew up in a home where quite frankly, my father used to say, your mother is the Statue of Liberty. You didn't know that. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm interested to know whether or not there are any uh, attempts or have there been any um, in the other markers that are already there, um, mechanisms to connect the now to the then because I think one of the biggest, um, uh, one of the biggest chasms in the understanding of America, who we are and our history is that we, we stop with the then without realizing that the then is right now. The arrival that you are talking about is evidenced 
in everything that we do today in America and around the world, the diaspora and the slave trade was a global business. The global economy was built on the sale and the labor of African people in America and beyond, but then ultimately America. How do we take these markers and get people to see from the arrival where they stand right now? Is there an attempt to do that? Is there, is there any objection to doing that or? Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no, there's no objection. Uh, all I'm saying is that we have to identify that this is a place where their presence was first recorded. Gotcha. That, that is it. We are hoping. I mean, you know, if you talk about a vision, yes, I'm hoping, hoping that each one of these locations will then start a process of educating. But if I, you know, if I die tomorrow and those of us with this project die tomorrow, then I can pretty much assume that there may be four more markers that go up and the other locations may or may not ever have anything that records this initial presence. So it is, I think it's crucial that you look at this as a starting point. It's not, it's not the full range. We're not equipped to do that. We're not educators. But we certainly will, will hope that this would start another kind of conversation. Well, we, oh, go ahead, Chris. No, no, I'm just I'm sorry, my enthusiasm, I just said fantastic, but I was looking at the clock and I'm afraid we're beginning to run out of time. So Courtney, why don't you, why don't you wrap it up and let us know what we think next steps might be with Anne? Yeah, so um, if anyone is interested in a call uh, that we can, or that Waterfront Alliance can organize and Anne, I can talk to you about it as well in terms of timing to follow up on next steps, because I, I have a feeling we could probably, we probably should at least dedicate a half an hour, if not an hour, to talking about potential next steps and Jonathan make, making sure you can be there as well. And I think for the Waterfront Alliance is exactly what Jonathan said. Can we be helpful in shepherding? What can we do? How can we be helpful? Uh, what resources can we bring toward, towards moving this forward uh, and, and defining what we move forward? So. Uh, so I will, so how about, I will send an email to everyone who attended or everyone and, and then you will respond, you can respond and, and uh, we'll get together with a, a time in the next three, two or three weeks, probably. Does that sound good? Like a good next step? Great. Okay. Um, so okay. yeah, go ahead, Chris. <laughs> no, Courtney, go, please. My bad. No, I was just going to wrap it up because we've got one minute left. I just want to say thank you so much to Anne. This was uh, it exceeded expectations and on so many levels and yeah just a huge round of applause and for all of your work for so long and our thankfulness that you got that birthday gift <laughs> <laughs> thank you everyone for for coming and listening and and you know having interest in in doing something in new york beautiful thank you Anne. thank you everybody thank you, thank thank you. for putting this together and we're going upward Onward and upward. Bye-bye.